the Joe Rogan experience. So what year was your incident? And you, you have a very, very famous incident that's corrob corroborated by actual evidence, which is one of the rare ones. What year was it and where did it take place? So it was 2004, November 14th. Uh, the It's really, if you draw San Diego to Ensenada, Mexico, we're about 60 miles off the coast in between the two. We're doing workups. So when we get ready to deploy, this was for the 2005 deployment. Uh, we were going at sea for November and December of 2004. So we had been out. I had just taken over the squadron mid-October. So I had been the CO for a month. So we go out uh, and we're putting the battle group pieces together. So it's not just the, the air wing, but we're, you know, we're, we're on the carrier. We've got the cruiser. We've got all the support ships out there. And we're going to integrate all the defenses and train as one unit. So the exercise that we're going to do is an air defense exercise where there's good guys, bad guys. They're all from internal from the air wing. So the bad guys today are going to be the Marines, uh, VMFA-232, the Red Devils. So they're going to launch, and they're going to go about 100 miles south of the ship, and we're the good guys. And it's we call it a 2v2, so it's two of us against two of them. And we're going to work with the USS Princeton, which is going to be the controller, and they're going to control the blue forces, and then the red guys are going to give us a presentation that, you know, they're going to try and intercept so we can stop them from getting up towards a carrier. So that's kind of the training set that we're all good. So the Marines take off first, and they start heading to the south. Now, we have no idea that for two weeks, this, the two weeks we've been at sea, they've been tracking these things coming out of the sky. And when I talked to the Prince controller, he's like up to about a dozen of them. They would come down from above 80,000 feet. They'd drop down to about 20,000 feet. They'd hang out, and then they'd go straight back up after about three or four hours. Now, when you say they've been tracking them, who specifically? This is the USS. The Princeton was tracking them. They saw them on the Nimitz radar, and the E-2 could see them. Um, so, cause they're out there, you know, that radar is on all the time and the, the spy one system on an Aegis cruiser is, you know, the state is probably the most, one of the most sophisticated systems in the world. So typically when something like this happens and there is some unexplained phenomenon, what do they do? Uh, in this case that, you know, to, if it was, if we were in a threat environment, they would tell us, but we're off the coast of San Diego. It's, it doesn't come to the air wing. So we have no idea that these things are out there at all. So they observe these things. And they never bothered telling any of you guys. That's correct. So they just knew that these things had been visiting this area, yes. but they just allowed this training exercise to take place anyway. Yeah. The, talking to them, the previous, for the two weeks, they would show up, but it was when we weren't flying. Mm -hmm. So the typical carrier schedule is, you know, for us, it was about noon to midnight. It's a 12-hour day. There's reasons for that. You can go a lot longer. They can, But for training, we just do the 12-hour day thing. And it's cyclic ops. So you got guys taking off and landing periodically. So we were on one of the first goes, you know, it's, you know, noon, one o'clock, somewhere around there, and we take off. The Marines take off first, and my buddy Cheeks, who's the CEO of the Marine Squadron, was one, he was leading the Red Air. They had, when he launched off the carrier first, they called him up and said, hey, what do you got on board? Well, the, the small, the original legacy F-18s don't have as much gas as the Super Hornets. Super Hornets about 30% bigger. So they start talking to him about fuel, and based on how long we're going to be airborne and everything else, they go, hey, why don't you just go ahead and proceed to your, your cap point, because we had just taken off. And that's when the controller had come up and said, hey, yeah, I forget our call center. It's probably like dealer is usually what we went. So they'll be like dealer 1-1. One, one, uh, this is uh, Princeton Control. What do you got? You know, say your loadout. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled. He said, I said, well, I got a Cadm 9, which is a, it's a, basically a, just a blue metal tube with a seeker head for an AIM-9 IR missile. It's a training. It doesn't come off the airplane. You can beat it with a sledgehammer. That's the only way you're going to get it off. Or you got to unlock the lugs with a key. So I'm like, kind of chuckling. He goes, well, hey, we're going to cancel the training. So we're like, okay. He says, we got real world vector and they're going to send us out to the West. So picture if it's, uh, you know, if you've got a clock, the Nimitz is in the middle. Uh, we're a little bit uh, south of that, about 40 miles south. And then the Marines are about a hundred miles south of the ship, about 60 miles between the two of us. So as this is all happening, my wingman is joining up, you know, right? and these are F-18Fs, so there's two people in each jet. So it's me and my WIZO, which is weapon systems operator, and I've got the other pilot and the weapon systems operator in the other jet. So they tell us all this, hey, we're in a real-world vector, and they send us out 270, about 60 miles away from where we're going. So now we're going out even further out to sea. We have no idea what we're intercepting, and this is when the, the controller starts talking to us. He says, hey, sir, we've seen these objects. They've been... For two weeks, they've been coming down, and he's given us the whole story. He says, we need you to go investigate. We want to know what these are. So but they're asking you to investigate in a jet that's unarmed. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, we have no – and there's reasons for that, that we don't fly – we typically don't fly with live ordnance unless we're actually going into, like, a combat zone 
or we're on a training range and we're going to shoot something. And the reason is you can go through history of the Navy or Air Force. If you put live missiles on airplanes and then you start doing training where you're squeezing the trigger, someone always messes the switchology up and someone gets shot down. It's happened multiple times. So we don't do it. You know, there's times that we do, but it's rare. So we start flying out to the west. Now, I want you to think, because the other pilot has a, you know, when you talk to, it's, it's out there, it was a female. When you talk to her, it's, uh, it, here's the, kind of goes through the mindset of, hey, we're off the coast of Mexico, real world vector. We have no idea what we're going to look at. Probably drug runner, because you get the mm. drug runners coming up the coast. So we're like, okay. So we drive out, and the, they're calling down ranges. So they're telling us, hey, it's 270 at 30 miles at 20,000 feet. And it's, you know, and then you just count down the ranges. And we're talking back and forth the whole time. So they got to a point where they say, hey, merge plot, which means radars have resolution cells, you know, range and azimuth of what the radar can actually see. Once you're inside that box, you can't tell the difference between me and the object I'm going at. We're just become one big blob. Mm. So they call merge plot. And so the other jet is on my left-hand side. Um, and we're gonna, and I'm going to go to a clock code to make it simple. So the object we're going to end up looking for is in, right in the middle of the clock. And we are at the 6 o'clock position. And my wingman is off to my left side. So it's she's further down with her wizzo. So as we're looking around, we, we look to the right. And there's a – it was yesterday was a perfect example out here. The water is perfectly calm, no white caps. I mean, it's literally a perfect San Diego, California day. And we see white water, something like if you see a seamount, you know, a rock underwater when you're standing on the shore and the waves are breaking over it and you're like, what is that? It's usually because there's a rock under the water. So it looks like that, but it's about the size of a 737. It actually kind of has a shape of like a cross and it's pointing to the east. So you've got the long part going east-west and you've got a couple of things going north and south. So as we're looking at it, because that kind of draws our eyes, we're like, oh, that's kind of odd. We look down and the, the Wizzo in the other airplane comes up and says, hey, skipper, do you? And that's about what he gets out of his mouth. And I'm kind of looking at the same thing. I go, dude, do you see that? What is that thing? And what we see is this white tic-tac looking object just above the surface of the water pointing north-south and it's going north-south, east-west. It's just radically moving forward, back, left, right at will. And it's moving around the disturbance, the, the white water that we see. How big is this thing? So, uh, over time, it's about 40 feet long. And the way I estimate that is, I mean, I got a lot of time fighting other airplanes, so it's about, about the size of a Hornet, fuselage. So that's why you say 40 feet. And this thing's just going left. So the first thing you see when you look down, you go, and this is with our eyes, it's not sensors, right? So we're looking down at this thing, and first thing you think is helicopter, right? They're, they, they, the helicopters typically stay below 200 feet when we're out there, and they're just driving around. We're, we're pretty far away from the ship for a helicopter for one of ours. So what is it? So the first thing you look for is rotor wash. You know, if you've watched any TV show that starts kicking the water up, and you can see that. It's really easy to see from the air. So we're like, oh, no rotor wash. Matter of fact, don't see any rotors. Don't see any tail rotor. Don't see any, you know, the main rotors. We're like, oh, that's kind of weird. So as we're driving around, we're looking at this thing. We get to about the 9 o'clock position. How far away are you from this thing? I'm at 20,000 feet, and it's right down on the surface, right off our right side. So I'm probably maybe a couple miles lateral and 20,000 feet and we're just watching it move around and so it's very small in your eyes um not overly small i mean an airplane down that low it's 40 feet you, you can, can see, see pretty it. well uh, with it was pretty clear so i'm like okay so i said i'm gonna go check it out that's what we're trained to do the other pilot says hey i'm gonna stay up here and i'm like that's perfect so now we'll, we'll get some separation we'll get it from different views and the other airplane will kind of have a god's eye view of everything that's going on as i go down and check this thing out so I start driving around, and it's still doing its forward, back, left, right. It's still pointing north-south. We get to about the 12 o'clock position. I'm just in a nice, easy descent. And the reason, you know, because I've been asked, oh, can you go more aggressive? You can, but when you're out over water, the water looks the same at 20,000 feet as it does at 2,000 feet. You don't, you know, so you can easily put yourself in a non-recoverable position if you're not paying attention and you go into the water. So I got this nice, easy descent. I get to about 12 o'clock, and as I'm coming down, you know, I, I – could guess probably about, you know, 18,000 feet now, a couple thousand feet below the other airplane. The tic-tac just kind of rapidly goes boop and turns. So now it's kind of pointing east-west and now it mirrors us. So it's above the surface. We're up high. We're coming down. It starts coming up. I'm like, well, this is getting interesting. So we kind of drive all the way around a circle. I'm descending. It's coming up. And I get over to about the 8 o'clock position of the, on the clock. And it's over at about the 2 o'clock position. 
Well, the quickest way, as we know as kids, to get someone, you know, you can keep going around the circle. Nothing's going to happen. You cut across the circle. So I'm about, I don't know, probably two to 3,000 feet above it. And I just kind of drop my nose aggressively and I cut across the circle and it's coming this way. It's because I'm trying to fly to where it's going to be because I want to mm. join on it. I want to see how close I can get to it. Right. And as I'm pulling up, it's kind of starting to cross my nose and it starts to accelerate. And within about less than a second, as I start to pull nose onto it and it crosses right in front of me, it just goes poof and it's gone. So I call the other airplane. And I said, hey, do you guys, do you guys see that thing? And they're like, sir, it's gone. We don't, we don't see it at all. So I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. So we, we don't see it. We're looking. At the same time, I say, hey, let's turn around and let's go back to see what was in the water. You know, there's, was there something there? So we turn around. We're right there. We haven't gone anywhere. It's gone. Water's perfectly. There's no white water, nothing. It's just blue. We're like, okay. So we turn back around. Now we're heading back out towards the east. And I tell the controller, I said, well, I said, uh, you know, I first said, I'm kind of weirded out. And I told my, my backseater that. And we start heading back. And the, the controller on the Princeton comes up and he says, sir, you're not going to believe this, but that thing is back at your cat point. That was our original point where we were going to hold 40 miles south of the ship. So this thing has went from wherever we were at to, you know, about 60 miles in, you know, maybe 30, 40 seconds. It's already over there. And it just – and they didn't track it. It just appeared. He just it shows back up on their radar and they go, it's here. So we're like, okay. So we fly back. We don't see it. We don't see it on our radar. We don't see it on any of our sensors. We do like two runs and we come back to the ship and land. So as we're in our, it's, we call it the PR shop. We're taking off our flight gear. One of my crews is getting ready to go out. And I think they were going to be on a tanker mission, but they had a, a targeting pod on board. So they launch off and we're telling them about this before. And I, in uh, the backseater, uh, Chad says, he, he's really determined, he's going to find this thing. So he tells the pilot, hey, we're going to find this thing. So they're just out driving around, and in the back seat of a Super Hornet, uh, there's no stick, but there's side stick controllers, and they're to control the sensors because that's what the weapon systems guys do. And they can change displays really fast by just hitting a button, and it'll flip from the radar to the targeting pod. And the way the system actually works is when you see something on the radar and you designate it as your primary target, all the other sensors will look at that point. So it's everything is kind of synced together. So he picks up a hit on his radar and he goes to lock it up because I watched all the tapes. He goes to lock it up and immediately the radar can tell it gets signals back that it's being jammed. So, and technically jamming is an act of war. It starts jamming the radar, goes into a jam extrapolate, a bunch of stuff happens on the scope. Well, he's smart enough to castle to his targeting pod and he takes a passive track. And that's the video that you see of the Tic Tac where it's just sitting in the middle of the screen real quiet. Um, so he does that, and he, and he goes through – if you watch the video, if we had it, I'd go through it with you. But they go through all the different modes. So he goes – it's an IR and an EO. EO is TV. It's a black and white TV camera. We do – we can get the video, right, online? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, let's, yeah. Let's get the video, Jamie. Where would you uh, – can't show it to anybody. Uh, yeah. we, can't, we can't show it on YouTube, but you can see it, and people will cool. be able to go to it. You know what we'll do? Go to the video – and we'll tell people when we're starting, and we'll tell people what the title of the video that you get to is, and they can sync it up themselves if they're watching it. It's publicly owned. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's publicly owned. It's, you know, American government released right. it. So it is actually something in the public domain. So you think we could play it on YouTube and uh, not get pulled? Yeah. A hundred percent. You think can, so, Jamie? It's a government. I, those things, I would say, yes, we should be able to. But sometimes those things get messy. So I just, let's take a I'd chance. Take a, okay, let's right, take a right, chance right, with right, this one. Okay, right. I know if you go, if, if you find a New York Times article, there's a link to it. It's a Pentagon release. The, the, YouTube is crazy with copyright stuff, and we we've always been like two steps away from getting pulled off of YouTube completely. It's a real disaster. It's I, I understand from their perspective, there's a, a lot of legal issues they have to deal with. But I have it on a private server. I could. S- Maybe send Jamie. The issue, it. I believe, though, is the actual copyright of the video itself. Oh, it's just it's a you, Pentagon Pentagon release, release public okay. domain. And the Pentagon's going to come after us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so either. Did you find it? Yeah, I, I want to find a good version of the video that doesn't have somebody. Jeremy, else's copyright. do you know? Yeah, yeah I've got okay. an unwatermarked version. Let me just look it yeah, up and send it to you. Tons of Jeremy will get it to it. us. I have to figure out how to send it to you right here. Give me a second. And do you have uh, AirDrop? Or could you airdrop yeah, it? Yeah, but I got it on a it? pay. I got it on a page, a private page. I can send Jamie. Oh yeah, okay, okay. okay. Do you have Jamie's uh, info? Uh, no. Yeah, send I'll, it. I'll write it down. 
Okay. I'll figure or it out. Or you can you send it to me and I'll send it to him. Okay. That's pretty easy. Um, sorry to disrupt the momentum. No, you're good. Um, but uh, I think this it's probably important to be able to have this, uh, the, the video itself, so you could just talk about it. And um, we're about to uh, yank it up here. Okay, Jamie wrote it down for you. There right, you thanks. go. Give me a second to get it out. Okay. And for people who don't know, Jeremy uh, also produced uh, Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. And he was in here when we had Bob Lazar in, talk about Bob's experience. And Jesus, if that wasn't a, a game changer for me and for a lot of other people. This is a subject that it's so easy to mock. You know, this is why I think it's so important that we talk to people like you because – like I said, just your average everyday UFO crackpot. They believe everything and anything. Have you? Did you? Had you ever had any UFO experiences before this? No. The, the irony, and I, I tell this story. My mother-in-law, <laughs> she'll be listening. She, she literally every time I would go home, she would ask me, "Hey, did you see UFO? Did you see UFO?" And I'd be like, "No." <laughs> and when I first started dating my wife, she was a big like National Enquirer. She had all the 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 you know supermarket tabloids, and I would always just feed her crap for it. So I, this happens, and you know, and I'm, I never say a word. So my friends all knew it was a great story over beers because they'd go, hey, what's the coolest thing you ever saw flying? I go, I chased a UFO. And they go, get out of here. I go, no, seriously. And I tell them the story, and they're like, dude. I go, yeah. So I go home, and, and uh, I got, got asked by Lou Elizondo to do the New York Times article, which as like anything else, I always say no. Like it took a bunch of times to get me on your show. Jeremy kept asking, 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 and it was – Thank you, Jeremy. My yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, you got to thank my contractor's wife, Angel, who – we were at a party drinking, and she goes, you got to do Rogan. I go, what? She goes, it's the biggest podcast on the planet. She goes, you got to do it. And I go, all right, I'm going to do it. Just for you, I'm going to do this show. So Shout out to Angel. Yeah, from New Hampshire. So <laughs> um, so my mother-in-law, we're sitting there, and, and I know the New York Times article is going to come out and. And so I'm, it was at Thanksgiving in 20, when the article came out, 17. So it was Thanksgiving in 2017. And everyone had kind of left the house. So it's just my wife and my in-laws, a couple of us sitting in the kitchen. And I said, hey, I got to tell you guys this. They said, what? I said, there's going to be this article comes out in the New York Times, and I'm in it. And they're like, yeah. I go, well, I chased a UFO. And my mother-in-law's like, ha-ha. <laughs> she looks at my father-in-law. He's rolling his eyes, looking at me like, oh, are you serious? And I go, yeah, oh, yeah. And, and uh, she's like, you never told us. I go, I never really told anyone. I mean, my wife and kids knew the event happened, but they didn't have all the details because it's just one of those things we just didn't, I just didn't get into. Is it classified? No. Or was it at any point in time? No, there's a lot of rumors out there that uh, I was classified and the ship got locked down. No, it wasn't. It was, we were never, men in suits did not show up. Um, no one told us not to talk about it. And this is because there's a lot of other people saying other things. And I said, this look at it. Here's the context. So in the battle group, you've got the admiral, you got the captain of the ship, the captain of the Princeton, and then you've got the other COs. So in position wise, I'm probably as a CO of a squadron in the top twenty out of six thousand. And no one came to talk to me. No one came to take my tapes. No one showed up in a suit. No one told me not to talk. No one talked to any of my air crew that were involved in this all. There were six people total involved, the two that shot the video and the four of us that looked at it for five minutes with our eyes. No one, nothing. It just, uh, and I can get into how, uh, the, you know, there's a report that uh, that George Knapp got released. It's a, I call it the unofficial official report. Um, and I had met someone and I'm like, hey, can you find anything out? I had this incident. And normally when you, you tell people this, they look at you like, dude, what are you smoking? And I'm like, no, no, I'm good. I'm tested. And they go, <laughs> and and they said, well, let me let me see what I can do. And I had got a call. Um, I was working, I was doing some aerospace work, and I had gotten a call on my cell phone from a guy. And he said, hey, I want to investigate your incident. And I go, Okay. So he did. He investigated the incident, and it was very, very thorough. I mean, if you've read the, it's about ten pages long. And he, I mean, he tracked down everybody. He tracked down all the people that were the air crew that were involved. He talked to. He tracked down the admiral. He talked. I mean, he. he it was a pretty thorough report. And I didn't think anything of it, you know, because you know, you know, the the people were worded that's out there, so they want to do FOIA, but it was never released in a FOIA request. I actually had the Navy call me. I'd been out of the Navy for like six years. and I Let's got, explain to people that means uh, Freedom of Information Freedom of Information Act. Act. So I got called uh, by a public affairs person from the Navy and said, hey, is this Commander Fravor? And I said, yeah. And they said, hey, do you know of any 
documentation on your UFO incident off the Nimitz. And I said, official. And she said, yeah. I said, no, because I knew the report existed. But to me, it was an unofficial because I didn't know who, where it went. I, and I had a copy of it. But because it wasn't official, well, then years later, I find out that the guy who actually did the report was part of the ATIP team. And I was talking to Lou Elizondo, who runs that program. And Lou showed me the documentation of the original. I think it's like 13 people that were part of ATIP, and they were FOIA exempt. And I'm like, well, that's kind of, well, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> He's the guy that did the report, which is why it never, ever came out mm. until uh, George got his hands on How it. How is something Freedom of Information Act exempt? Um, obviously, DOD has the ability because I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a conspiracy theory person at all. I mean, I'll just tell you that. You know, and I think there's reasons that the government doesn't tell the public everything. Um, and I don't speak for the government, but I think there's a good reason for that, that not everything needs to go out to the public. But most of it does. And they just what they do is they put a clause on, hey, for this program or whatever we're doing, which would have been an ATIP program, the work that they do and what they find is not – it's not releasable through Freedom of Information Act. There's probably other avenues to get that. You know, and then you go, well, what really is freedom of information? Because I got into this on a – I was talking to someone who's a conspiracy theorist, and they said, well, so-and-so wrote, and they're not getting any information on your event. I said – so what are they going to do? They're going to call up. You're going to put in your request for, for freedom of information. You go, here's what I want. It goes to some poor guy at the Pentagon who's like, I have no idea what this is. And he searches around. He doesn't find anything. He looks at his bud and I get it all for you. I go, hey, Joe, you got anything on the Nimitz incident? And you go, nope. And I go, okay, well, I didn't find anything. I looked. I did my due diligence, but I'm not going to spend the next six months of my life doing your research project for you. Right. So and you get nothing and then you assume the government's covering up when the got government it. really isn't. They just – you know, the guys doing the research doesn't know where it's at or Makes doesn't have sense. access to it. So. Makes sense. Um, Jamie, we have the video? Okay. Here we go. Now, to explain what what is what are we seeing and why are we seeing it in this uh, this particular Okay, shade. so we'll just kind of go around. So if you look at the uh, don't uh, OPRs operate on the top left corner, NAR is narrow field of view, which is zoomed in. Uh, IR at the top middle, it means it's an infrared mode. So instead of seeing color – you're seeing temperature variations. Okay. And these things are extremely sensitive to when like tenths of degrees, they will tell you the difference due to color. So it'll go from black to white. So in this case, white is hot. So if you look down on the bottom left corner, it says WHT. Um, mm -hmm. That's white. It means white is hot. So the object that you're looking at is hotter than the sky around it. But what you also notice is there's no plumes. Now, if you're looking at an airplane, when you get closer, you'll actually see the exhaust coming out and there'll be a, a really glowing plume. That's important as, as we look at the video. And then the most of the stuff on here, you really don't need to know. What you can look at is uh, the bottom right corner, it says 19,990 and a B. That's the altitude. And uh, if you look up in the little words where it says HDG and then BALT, B, it's autopilot. So it's on altitude hold. It's just flying uh, for that. So you can go ahead and play the video. And so those two bars next to the white object, that's a that's – a, that's a passive track. So what he's done is he's commanded the FLIR to track that. So what the system does is it uses uh, – it's actually tracking. It can track pixels, and it's just basically blocked those hot pixels, those white pixels from the black ones. And then you're going to see now – pause it real quick. So over the top, see, it went to a white screen with a black object. This is a black and white TV mode. And if you look at the top, it says TV. So narrow in TV mode is actually – you can get closer than narrow in IR. It, it, it's literally narrow in IR is about medium in TV mode. So there's, you can get closer with the TV mode. So as you look at it now, in this case, you would actually start to see um, stuff going on. And even in TV mode, because you get exhaust, you know, the black exhaust that comes out, you'll usually be able to see kind of some of that coming out of the back and you don't see anything. This thing's just sitting there. And if you look at the, uh, the top where it says three right, that's the pod is looking three degrees right of the nose of the airplane, right? So he's just flying along the bottom numbers. Don't worry, those are time. So it's 4156. So go ahead and hit play. And what, what he's doing is he's going, Chad's going through all the different modes because he's like, oh, I got it. And he's going to try and see the best video that he can get. Now, there's rumors that this video is like 10 minutes long. No, what you're looking at is the entire video. Now, notice where it says 99.9. .9. Mm -hmm. So hit pause real quick. What that means is the why he's got the pod, the targeting pod, because that's his primary sensor right now. The radar is still trying to look at this object and trying to range it. And the radar can't get ranging on it. So... The object is doing something to say, I'm not giving you back because it's just a Doppler radar, just like a police radar is a Doppler. It's trying to get a ranging on you, and it can't do it. So when it says 99.9, .9, the radar cannot see this object right now. Hmm. It's not allowing it to get ranging. The, and I think that's super important, Dave, the way he explained it to me. Active jamming compared to passive jamming. This is a technology that is actively jamming this system. 
rather than something like stealth aircraft, which is well, the shape and the texture explain. of the. Yeah, it's because everyone thinks stealth is invisible. It's not. It's it's just it's a technology to to basically make it harder for radars to see you. You know, and that's the whole thing. You know, if you look at uh, you know airplanes that are nose on uh, are harder to see than airplanes at the sides. Kind of like. Think of a barn door. If you're looking at the whole barn door, it's really mm-hmm. easy. See, if I turn the barn door sideways where it's really thin, it's going to be a lot harder for you to see it. Got it. So that's it. that's the easiest, most basic way to look at this. So keep going. You can play again. And you can look. The, the airplane is still sitting at 20,000 feet. It's doing 250 knots. He's going to go through different modes and try and lock it. And uh, it's just kind of sitting. And all of a sudden, as the video goes on, I think it's a minute and a half long. See, it's going to try and reacquire. It recenters the pod. So it's it's slowly drifting to the left. The, the the Hornet is still going the same heading, just kind of hanging out, and they're just filming this thing. And then when they get close, it's going to zing off the left-hand side. When you see it on a full, because this, you know, you think digital, you'd be able to get a one-for-one copy, unlike, you know, when you copy your album to a cassette, you know, you lose a little quality. Well, you still do in digital world, and they're, off it goes to the left. And that's pretty fast to leave that field of view. On the when We, we have big monitors that we look at these when they come back, so we're looking at the original tapes. So Play the end of that again, please, Jamie. So when it's taking off, how fast when, – when it just sort of like leaves the field of view and takes off to the left, how fast is that going? Uh, I would say pretty fast. It's an estimate. If we had ranging, you know, you could obviously do the triangle and go, hey, because we mm-hmm. know how big the field of view is. But for something to leave the field of view that fast with the pod just staring is pretty fast. I mean, it, it just – it's like out of here. Like but, nothing that we have? No, because we can't – I don't care what airplane is. So let's just use the F-22 Raptor. That's probably one of the, it's, it's probably the best airplane in the world right now, performance wise. Um, it can't take off like that, it, especially if it's a hover. I mean, you're, you're talking something that's just sitting in space in the wind, and then it just all of a sudden accelerates. Airplanes don't work that way. And it's not leaving any exhaust plume. No, notice there's none. And when Play you go back again, to the Jamie IR at the end, even in the IR, you don't. Yeah, see, see there's it. IR zoomed in, and there's no. You would see a plume if that was an airplane. It's creepy how it takes off. Yeah. With active jamming, it's intelligently controlled. There's no rotors. There's no plumes. There's no exhaust. There's no tail fin. There's no uh, tail number. This thing goes from a standstill, takes off. It's a propulsion system we don't have in our inventory, and no other nation does. That's how it's understood by the government. Now, that that's w- w- so if the fastest plane on Earth was trying to do that same maneuver, this system would be able to track it? Um, yeah, oh well, yeah, it would stay with it until it got to the, the limits of the pod, you know, mm-hmm. as far as looking to the left. But right. Right. And, you know, the radar would see it. I mean, when you get, you get close enough, you're going to, you know, you, everything becomes visible because you get burned through with radar and how, how radars actually work. This one is, you know, <laughs> you, you tell me, but it, this was it, performance beyond. I mean, it's like when we saw it disappear – when it flew in front of my nose, and I'm talking something, I'm, I'm within a half mile of it, looking at it, and it gets in front of me and just disappears. So take, we'll just go to something that everyone knows is fast. Let's just say SR-71 that's doing Mach 3. You know, the visibility is 50 miles. So even at 35 miles a minute, I'm going to be able to see this thing turn into a little dot as it goes off into the horizon for probably a minute. The thing that we saw disappeared in a second. Just gone. And that's from two different angles. Remember, the other airplane's 8,000 feet above me because we, we get close to it at about 12,000 feet. So the other airplane's above me looking down, and when it disappeared, I said, do you guys see it? And they said, no, it's gone. It just literally was poof. 